Hi, my name is Charles Malky, biologist and plant expert with Ivory Organics, where we grow cool plants. And today we're going to be talking about the value of summer pruning your blueberries, specifically pruning your blueberries after the summer harvest. But before we begin, let's start off with a quote that I found that I want to share with you that's relevant to blueberries. And it's, and it's a quote from Elon Shammer, and it reads as follows. The title is Advice from a Blueberry. It reads, be well-rounded, soak up the sun, find beauty in small things, live a fruitful life, be a good pick, it's okay to be a little blue, make sweet memories. And this lesson is all about the value of summer pruning and we're going to compare that and contrast it to winter pruning. Specifically, we're going to be talking about blueberries. But these lessons that I'm going to share with you apply to a lot of your fruit, roses, and other plant care as well. And, and the reason I'm doing this educational lesson specifically on blueberries and talking about summer pruning is that I've noticed that the vast majority, as much as 90% of the content when it discusses blueberry pruning, discusses winter pruning at the detriment of discussing the value of what summer pruning can do for your plants. And we're also gonna have an educational segment in the middle where you're gonna to get to meet Tom Spellman of the Dave Wilson Nursery. And the Dave Wilson Nursery is one of the leading distributors of fruit trees throughout the country. And he's gonna talk about the importance of summer pruning specifically for blueberries. And I'm gonna share that with you guys momentarily. In addition to pruning, we're also gonna discuss the value of whitewashing, we're gonna discuss feeding, we're also going to discuss improving the soil, and so many other important lessons. And I'm going to try to hit all of these topics as fast as possible. Just to share with you right now, here we are in Los Angeles, California. It's now the middle of August. In front of me here is the Misty Blue variety of blueberries. We planted these together um, just a few short months ago, and I'll put some clips where you can see um, just how small this was just a few months ago. And now here we are, as you can see, there's a lot of new growth. There is, I was about to say no fruit as I spotted this little thing, but this is not the actual size of the blueberries. These actually, um, again, being this variety, again, being the Misty Blue, creates more of a medium to large variety of blueberries, and we've enjoyed this so very much. In, contra in contrast, let me share with you the blueberry bush I have behind me that still has about a dozen fruit. Those are called the Sunshine Blue varieties. And it's also a shorter growing plant, closer to about two to three feet. And if you come in here, you can see that there's a few more blueberries left. I'm gonna try to get a few more here and check those out. So these are a lot smaller. You can see here's a smaller one, but I wouldn't say the largest one was any larger than this. Whereas the misty variety of blueberries had blueberries almost double the size of these blueberries. So I really enjoyed the larger size. It was just more enjoyable picking and consuming and using um, within the kitchen. So um, just again, a comparison contrast. Again, the sunshine blue variety on average grows about two to three feet. Whereas um, the one here in front of me, The misty variety of blueberries will grow an average of about four to six feet. So a much taller plant. Again, here we are in the middle of August. We're surrounded by fruit trees in all directions. We discussed the importance um, in our educational lesson a few months ago about the importance of keeping your blueberries in containers. So before I demonstrate summer pruning for you, let's quickly listen to a short lecture by Tom Spellman of the Dave Wilson Nursery and hear what he has to say about it first. Check this out. You know, I, I always feel this way. Most everything is going to grow better in the ground than it will in a container. But there's, there's an exception to that rule. And every rule there's an exception to. The exception there I think is blueberries. How many people have grown blueberries? Good, a lot of you are. Wow. Well, I absolutely, I have lots of different blueberries. They're all in half wine barrels. Some barrels have two or three or four varieties in the barrel, and I just grow them as one, you know, structure. And uh, nothing makes me happier than to go out onto my patio in May when my granddaughters are out there just mowing down on the blueberries on those half barrels. They're all right there where they can reach them, and I just think, have a, enjoy the blueberries. So, the blueberries. So, there, there's, 
for container culture, blueberries work really, really well. There are two things that are important to blueberry culture in Southern California. And we have all kinds of varieties that do well here. Anything that's considered a Southern high bush blueberry or a Southern hybrid type blueberry will all do well in Southern California with virtually no chill at all. The, the two critical elements for, for proper blueberry culture are you need an acidic soil mix and you need fast, fast, fast drainage. So they don't like to stay wet, they don't like to stagnate, they like to be thoroughly irrigated and go slightly dry in between, not bone dry, slightly dry. Yes. So again, keep it into consideration the ratio, the top to, to root zone ratio. So all my blueberries in half wine barrels are just this nice little ball that's about the size of the half wine barrel, so I keep them in balance. So when blueberry season's over, late July, 1st of August, at that point, I take them back heavily, take them back down to a, just a very small structure. That growth in August, September, October, into November, that's all your fruiting wood for the next season. So blueberries, you would never ever consider winter pruning a blueberry. You only want to summer prune blueberries. Every cut you make in the winter will be taking fruit away from that plant because they produce on all those tips that harden up in the fall when the plant goes dormant. And they usually don't even go dormant. They usually just get a little fall color and then the foliage will drop off in the spring as the new, as the new growth of the flowers come on. So for blueberries, if you're gonna plant them in the ground, nine out of 10 times you're gonna fail. If you wanna plant them in the ground, plant them in a raised bed where you're using that fast draining acidic mix. So like one third peat moss, one third uh, a ground bark, one third sandy fast draining soil. That'll give you that acidic mix and it'll give you that fast drain. So that'll work well. So in a raised bed, in a container, if you are gonna plant them in the ground, take a look at what all the blueberry growers in California do. They don't plant them in the ground. They lay out a row of organic material, two feet wide, 18 inches high, and they plant on the crest of that row of organic material and run their drip line right along the crest of that row. They don't dig a hole, they plant above grade. So they have good drainage and they have organics right there for, the, for those berries to root out into. So every, every blueberry farm you look at in California is gonna be done that way. It's all organic material above soil. And, and if they don't do that, they're probably, they didn't do their homework and they're probably gonna be in trouble in the near future. So if you wanna do blueberries, containers, raised beds, acidic mix, fast drainage, you'll be fine. So when it comes to summer pruning, the goal is as soon as you've harvested the fruit, to now control the size. Begin managing the size now in the summer as a plant, especially here in Los Angeles, California, we're in August, and again, this variety of blueberries, I already harvested the fruit off of it about a month ago, so I could have begun the pruning a month ago and taken advantage of about another four more weeks of growing in the desired direction rather than just having some random growth that we're then gonna manage in winter. So the first goal is by summer pruning, we're gonna create a structure that is growing in the desired direction and with desired health benefits. When the plant is as compact as it would grow naturally, sometimes, and there's a lot of research on this, when blueberries grow on their own, sometimes they'll end up hurting itself with the way that it grows to its detriment, ultimately killing the plant because of just the branches entangling one another and creating an ideal situation for disease and rot within the plant. That'll, again, ultimately shorten the life and ultimately put, possibly kill the plant. The goal when growing your blueberries is to grow them as healthy as possible so that you can capitalize on the number of flowers and ultimately your fruit yields from year to year. And to do so, it does require that you feed your blueberries. It does require that you prune your blueberries. It does require care and management just as any plant otherwise would. So I have with me a list and I just wanna make sure I hit all of these points. So the reason for pruning is um, one, the goal is to control the size. Let's say it's growing in the wrong direction. You want to make sure that your blueberry is where you want it to be. This variety of blueberries, being the misty variety of blueberries, will grow an average of four to six feet. So the goal is to kind of create a plant that will probably be closer to about three feet so that it can reach the four to six feet zone and you can manage it accordingly. Um, but as we go into winter, this plant should be closer to about three feet if the average is four to six feet come spring and summer. Second, manageability. We have a path that's just behind me and alongside. We've got trees that are surrounding it. 
and it's growing very well with the light that it's getting in between all of these tree canopies without direct sunlight being in an open space. Blueberries thrive basically being in a compact growing zone where even if you're growing blueberries, one blueberry plant would offer some shade and shelter to the blueberry next to it and that's basically how they perform best. So we've got these and I've noticed in a lot of Southern California gardens that the blueberries typically do best when in the, I don't want to say the canopy of a tree, this here is an open air space where the light travels from east setting in the west and it's pretty much getting light and at times filtered light throughout the entire day. So controlling size, manageability in regards to if some of the branches are growing towards another tree or, or entering your pathway, you're gonna to wanna to prune those additional branches. Um, I had the word compact. The goal when growing your blueberries is not to create a compact plant as that's gonna create bushiness and competition for light within the structure. The ideal situation is to create a vase shape plant as we've discussed many times with roses. And again, I even have next to me an apple tree, a three-in-one variety apple tree. And you may notice these three trunks with these three flavors of grafted apples are in a perfect vase-shaped position where the branches continue up and continue their vase-like structure. And the ultimate result is you end up with a canopy where each of the branches are capitalizing on light and each of those branches will ultimately support the maximum flowers and fruit and they're going to do so in a healthy way. This part is key. Blueberries flower and fruit on last year's wood. So here we are now in August. Any growth that is created this year will create the buds and the flowers that will ultimately create the fruit next year. So, as you can see, the new growth, if we can come in within the, um, if we can come in within the plant, this here is a sucker cane, as they call them. They came from the base of the plant. You can follow my finger, and this continues to grow and grow and grow and grow and grow and grow and grow. So this plant has created since we planted it. I would say one two three almost four feet of growth and remember this plant's supposed to grow four to six feet is the maximum height and this cane in just one year grew about four feet here um other growth if we come in within the canopy let me pick this branch that's a little closer you can see over here is a cane from last year with the new growth being this growth over here with all of the new leaves on it. Once fall comes, the color of the blueberry will change, the leaves will fall, and then it'll push out the new leaves on the new growth. But last year's growth will not create the flowers that will ultimately support the fruit. Again, we gotta protect the canes that are from this year to create the blooms and the fruit for next year. So on this point, the value of summer pruning is we're gonna create growth in an ideal situation in the ideal places that we want the plant to grow so that come spring, we got the maximum number of buds to have the maximum number of flowers to support the maximum number of fruit. If we do as the other 90% of the education that is basically sharing pruning lessons in the winter, if we apply that practice, then what we're doing is we're cutting off all of these potential bud wood that is ultimately gonna affect your yields for that following season. I'm quoting now a university, and there are several videos that actually um, say this similar sentence, but I'm quoting here that someone actually said from a university, and again, I quote, removing the flower buds, and I'm again, this was in winter, will increase fruit yield, and that is virtually impossible. How can removing more flower buds increase your fruit yield. What it will do by managing the size and creating a more compact plant and by maybe thinning the fruit come spring, if you see that it's, it's supporting more fruit than it otherwise should be supporting as it may damage some branches or it's taken away from the vigor of the plant, you may then thin the plant to create larger quality fruit and maybe less diseased fruit by thinning. But that's not 
going to increase yields by removing more buds come winter. And I'm hoping you guys understand the difference. We're going to end up maximizing the number of buds and maximizing yields by doing summer pruning. I think I've said this enough times. So a few tips before we start pruning is one, make sure if there's any dead wood that you remove that dead wood as dead wood is going to be a possible entryway for pests and disease within the living live parts of the plant. So any time of the year you see dead wood, remove it. Second tip, if there's any crossing branches, correct that as well. You could potentially stake it, but again, we've got time that if we prune it, it's gonna grow in the desired direction that we're gonna want to create that vase shape, open, airy structure, which is also gonna minimize disease within the plant by creating an open structure. And also, by creating an open structure, we're gonna capitalize on light that's gonna be striking each of the leaves where it's gonna create its sugars and minerals and nutrients necessary to support maximum blossoms for maximum fruit. The goal again, by pruning it now, is we're gonna get two to three more months of wood and canes basically growing in the directions that we want it so that they will then come spring, bloom with minimal pruning in late winter as most of the educational videos have been sharing. Well, let's get started now. So as we enter the plant, the first thing I'm looking for is the crossing branches. I wanna open the structure and create a vase shape. So the first thing is correct the canes so we've got a vase shape structure. So let's come in. If you take a look here, what you're gonna see is you're gonna see this low-lying cane going off to the side. I've got this cane going and growing towards me. Another cane off in this direction. One cane going pretty much straight up, but it's got a V shape within it. And um, I'm tempted to actually remove this cane and specifically I'm looking at this cane over here going in that direction as it's on top of two other younger canes. And again, um, again, this is just again some older growth that I feel like I'll be able to encourage more growth and more health on these younger, more vigorous stems than some of the older growth which is exhibiting slower growth as you can see we only got about six to eight inches of growth off of this particular older cane compared to some of these newer canes but we're going to have a balance between the older and the newer canes as when it comes to fruiting it's those canes that are between three to six years of age that are the most fruitful and the most productive those that are over six years should be removed that's just another general tip to apply as well so let's come in here and begin the pruning so the first thing I'm removing is a cane that's interfering with my vase shape open structure. So we're taking this branch out. And I'm continuing, even with these little canes that are not grown in that vase pattern, we're also removing. Another tip as I continue cutting, research supports a broad range of how much should be pruned from a blueberry. Blueberries perform best when pruned. It's mandatory that you prune your blueberries from year to year for maximum yields and optimal health of the plants. But that range ranges anywhere from 25% on the low end to as much as 70% on the high end. So I'm kind of gauging somewhere within that spectrum to prune. And I'm gonna share with you a tip on why it's important. And my general principle is regardless of the plant, and even if they say no pruning, that there is benefit in even pruning five to 10% per year. So being a very light pruning on um, virtually any plant. I'm gonna share with you why in just a second as I um, wrap this particular plant off. I'm gonna share that, that tip with you as well. So, so far what we did was we worked on creating that base shape. And I think now you can see that we've got these central canes that are in the middle that are more upright. We have these canes to the side, which are growing in the side direction. Any branches are going towards the middles we've removed. And as a result, we've now opened the plant to air, which will minimize on disease risks and pest issues. In addition to, we've opened up the light, which will now maximize the amount of sunlight hitting each of these leaves, which are the engines for creating the sugars and the minerals and all of the um, nutrients necessary for successful plant health. What we're gonna do next is 
Um, and it was on the list as well as one of the points is to remove the deadwood. And now that I've opened it up, I've actually found some deadwood within the plant. If you come in a little closer over here in this direction, and I'm just coming around here. If you take a look here, there's some deadwood right there. So what we're gonna do is go with the pruners, with a little bit of deadwood there, and there's some even more right here. And that's it. In addition to removing the deadwood, another consideration, and that's also one of the points, is to remove any of the low-lying branches. So low that once they support fruit, it may come in contact with the soil. And also, more of the pests. Imagine if there are any rodents or birds or whatever. Aside from the birds that are gonna be up in the canopy, anything that are low-lying and walking along the floor, you'd wanna keep the fruit off of it. In addition to, you wouldn't want the fruit to get contaminated with the soil, as that'll also bring a lot of the soil-borne diseases into the fruit and onto the plant. As you can see over here, there was once evidence of a beautiful cluster of blueberries. I wish I did a video um, just a couple of months back when this was just loaded with medium to large size blueberries. Um, it's not known, this misty variety of blueberries, it's not well known as carrying large. It's supposed to be more of a medium sized blueberry, but compared to the Compared to the sunshine blue variety to my left, these were noticeably larger, at least two to three times larger. So I really appreciated having this blueberry. My family really enjoyed these larger, more plump, and also very delicious. Both of them were very delicious um, blueberries, but I would try to err personally towards a larger size blueberry rather than a smaller size blueberry. But another also popular variety of blueberries that I've seen in nurseries as well that also creates a very large, delicious, um, blueberries is known as the jewel, so that's another one to consider as well. And so what we're going to do now is with the low-lying branches, as you can see here, I'm going to prune that and pull it back in to create a stronger branch structure like so. So what I'm doing is I'm basically coming in and I'm hoping you can capture this. I'm following the stems back and what I'm doing is I'm pruning at an angle about a quarter of an inch away from the next nearest stem, which is right here. This will create a stronger branch structure to better support fruit on it for next year. So as this area supports blueberries next year, it'll be stronger and the blueberries will stay off the soil level. And we're gonna do the same thing on this side. If you wanna come around, you'll see over in this area. This here is a very weak branch. This will easily take its fruit down to the ground level. So we're going to simply prune this back like so. And again, about a quarter of an inch away from the nearest bud. Um, further consideration, I'm thinking I'm gonna remove it entirely. Just to ensure that the fruit are more so off the ground. The, the last step I wanna share with you now is in regards to the crossing of the branches. This was something we pointed out earlier, but we've done nothing about it yet because I knew I was gonna now bring the height down. We're gonna talk about the management of the size of the plant, especially in containers, but this applies with all plants, both in containers as well as in ground, and that is to make sure that the top of the plant is, I don't wanna say equal to, but at least at 95 or less compared to the root mass. The point is, is to make sure that the root mass is always larger than the plant mass above the ground to ensure that the plant has a lot of vigor and strength and health to support all of the plant tissues, being the leaves, the stem, and the branches, and the, and, and, and the canes, or the trunk if it was um, a tree, as well as ensuring that you're getting the highest and best quality fruits off of your plants as well. So the next thing we're gonna address is the crossing of the branches. And um, as we mentioned this earlier, so in regards to correcting that, what we're gonna do is we're gonna bring the height back down and to encourage a little bit more bushiness at a lower height. Being that this plant is naturally supposed to be between four and six feet, and I've created an area where I do want it to reach close to its potential height, um, what I'm gonna do is simply bring it down a little bit across the across the entire plant, but I'm also gonna try to keep it more balanced. This here on my right is a little bit more newer growth, so it's a little shorter than a couple of these taller branches. This one over here is obviously the tallest, but what I'm gonna do is kind of like round the plant off by now selecting the branches a little lower. So I'm gonna start, again, I'm cutting at an angle about a quarter of an inch away 
from the nearest bud. And just like when pruning roses, I'm paying attention to where the buds are and I'm selecting a bud that's gonna grow away and out, away from the center of the plant. The same thing you do with your roses when creating a vase-shaped structure is you're looking for buds to continuously grow away from the center. So by selecting a bud that's on the outside of the stem, it'll further continue the growth out towards the side rather than selecting a bud and pruning in a direction that'll bring the growth back in towards the center. So that's the reason we've selected that. I'm now gonna continue the same pattern around. So here we go, like that, and like that. And this branch has already split. And again, I wanna encourage further branching. So we're gonna keep that going on. And this here is gonna create more branching as well within it. And then this tip over here, if you take a look, all I'm gonna do is simply remove the tip. And this again is gonna encourage more branching as well, like so. So here we go now. We've just concluded the summer pruning of this misty variety of blueberries that we have here in the container. Take a look at all of the cuttings that are down below. And if I were to guess, I probably pruned, I would say somewhere between 30 to 50%, not 50, I would say closer to 40% of the plant. And if you wanna come in a little closer, I wanna share with you how many canes that we're left with. Now we can count them together. We've got one down here, two, three, four, five, six. And we've discussed earlier that the ideal plant should have somewhere between six to as many as 15 canes. When deciding if six or 10 or 12 or 15 is the most appropriate, my advice and my recommendation to you is it depends on the size of the plant. A larger plant is naturally going to have more canes. A smaller plant is going to have fewer canes. It's just logical. Can a smaller plant have more canes? Yes, absolutely. That can happen. But with a smaller plant with 15 canes, there's going to be quite a bit of overcrowding compared to a large blueberry plant that's about, you know, let's say six to 10 feet tall. That's going to have a lot more room to support the larger number of canes. So when there's some research out there that says ideally the plant should have six canes or 10 canes or 12 canes or 15 canes. My advice and my recommendation to you, it depends on the size of the plant and how large you're gonna allow it to grow. Over here, we probably have a plant that's about two and a half to three feet tall, when we know that this should be a plant ranging again in height, somewhere between four and six feet. Um, if I can share with you now my sunshine blue blueberry, which is right behind you, what we're gonna do next is apply the same principles as we did to the Misty variety, and I'm gonna start pruning that right now. So give me about five to 10 minutes, and let me share with you the results. So check, take a look again at the before, and you're gonna see the after momentarily. So it's just getting ready to start the pruning. There's so much happening in here, and I wanna share that with you so you can see the before and after a little bit more closely. So if you can come in a little closer here, what I want to share with you is take a look at all of these new canes that are coming from underneath. So here's a new one. And then there's some new canes, as you can see, with this new green growth in contrast to the older canes from years past in those areas. More new canes behind it. But check out this runner cane way in the back. So this cane has left the central area. And I personally have never seen a runner cane this far away from the central area leader but if I've noticed as I start pulling it up it does come a little closer but I may use this if I want to propagate it chances are it'll begin to root between now and the next few months and I can use that um, in the future to create some more genetically identical blueberries check out all these worms just near the surface I don't know if you guys can see this in the images but I'm just tapping the soil and the soil is moving I'm like you would expect the worms to be a little deeper but they're everywhere in a good soil we're gonna talk about soil in just a moment, but let me get to pruning us. And I hear the last two cuts. And check out how much we took out of this sunshine blue blueberry. And if you wanna come in a little closer, you can see the new structure. 
We've got a balance now between the old wood over here, some more old wood on this side. We've got some newer branches and then some new shoots as well. And we're gonna be managing the old wood with the new wood with again, the goal being that the most productive branches, the most productive canes will be those that are between three and six years of age. So we're gonna be managing those from year to year to year. So now that we've just summer pruned our blueberries, I wanna share with you the importance of winter pruning and being that we've just summer pruned, we may not need to prune these blueberries in the winter. If you're going to prune your plants in the winter time, the best time for pruning is after the chance of frost has passed. So you're gonna be pruning it as late as you can in winter, but before the spring growth and flush of growth. You can actually look at your growing zone and look at these charts and find out when the last chance of frost is in your area, wait probably another week or two, and then prune your blueberries. The value of winter pruning would be as if there's large growth that is more than two years old, that ideally should be pruned late winter as the saps within the plants are very slow moving and it'll be a lot less stressful on the plant. But otherwise, for growth that's two years or younger, as we did in this situation, it's safe to be pruning during the summer, but there are things to be cautious of, which includes burn. When you, per when you prune your plants, there's a risk of burn within the entire plant that was once shaded that is now exposed to too much light. We're gonna discuss that momentarily, but before we do, let me share with you a diagram that talks about the value of pruning your plants periodically throughout the year. Check this out. I just wanna demonstrate, and pardon my artistic abilities, but I wanna quickly demonstrate the importance of pruning your plants, even if it's a plant that's not supposed to be pruned, a simple pruning of even 5% per year could swing the plant in a position of proliferation, growth, bigger health, so many benefits by simply pruning. And let me explain to you why. If this is the ground level and here is the plant above the ground level is we can call it the cane if we're dealing with the blueberry, it could be the tree trunk. Here are the branches off the tree. And we'll add a couple of leaves. But this is irrelevant for this purpose. So here's our tree above the ground. Below the ground, we've got these roots. And the plant's roots generally can expand two to three times beyond the root zone or the drip zone, let's say of the canopy. So if the canopy's here, the roots can go two to three times further than the distance from the canopy. This helps anchor the plant. And again, we've taught this in other lessons in the past that most of the roots, even in ground roots, as much as 70 to 90% of the roots are in the top 18 inches of soil. So improving the soil, we're gonna talk about amending the soil and feeding the plants, but just improving just the topsoil when watering will improve pretty much 90% of the entire root zone and the health of the plant. Point I wanna share with this and with pruning is just as we've seen dead wood within the tree due to freeze, similarly below the ground, there's gonna be some roots that will die from year to year. And if, the plant above the ground is larger than the root system below the ground, then the plant is gonna look really stressed. It's gonna grow minimally from year to year. It's gonna support inferior fruit or maybe no fruit at all. Um, its entire pattern is not gonna look like the actual plant that it was intended to be if the top of the plant is, let's say top heavy, compared to the base of the plant being the roots. So it's important by basically pruning the canopy in, whether it be 5% or as we did today, closer to 50%, by removing that canopy, we now have a stronger base to create a better plant. I hope this makes sense, but I hope you can enjoy my graphics here. Well, let's continue on with the blueberry plants. So the next lesson we're gonna do now is a gardening principle known as whitewashing. And 
the idea of whitewashing is applied to even construction where you might whitewash bricks being light in the bricks or you might whitewash your deck being to light in the deck what we're going to do in this scenario is we're going to whitewash these blueberries that are now exposed to too much light we've just opened the canopy here we are in the middle of august and we're going to have days that are continue to be long in excess of 12 hours of light that are potentially going to now burn the inside of the plant let me share with you before i explain the products um a couple of scenarios of burn that were not protected and how these products are going to further and better protect your plants so let me share with you a couple of examples one being an avocado tree and a second one being a rose bush that suffered burns in temperatures that exceeded 110 degrees here in los angeles and in fact we had temperatures that hit 117 degrees here in this part of los angeles um, and let me share with you some of the damage that resulted from it check this out so here we are next to a fuerte avocado we're just on one side of it over here and you may notice that some of the leaves um have burnt to a crisp during the burn and What's even worse than the leaves is the actual stems of the plant have also burnt as well. And you can see that the damage is all alongside the entire exposed area of the tree. And you can see that this branch is ultimately doomed as the burn has pretty much gone all the way through to the even shadier side of the plant as well. So right there. So this branch is very unlikely to make it. Even if the plant survives, the majority of the trunk has been damaged with more likely than not third degree burns, being the entire bark has burned, the underlying cambium tissues, and now it's the underlying wood that is relatively new as this is all this year's growth. So it's weak and it's unlikely to support any additional growth and especially no fruit so we're gonna end up having to prune that um but again i'm continuously pruning and shaping throughout the plant but i'm going to share with you how the ivory organics products could have protected this avocado tree and we're going to be visiting a couple other properties with third degree avocado burns throughout southern california i'm hoping within the next couple of months i've got a few properties i got invited to and i'm hoping i can share those with you and lessons that they've applied to better care for those plants and so we're going to be doing that together as well well let me share with you the rose bush as well follow me so here we are in the double delight rose garden area and for those of you that may have seen just a couple of months ago we missed the late winter which is the ideal time for pruning your roses and instead we did it in spring we whitewashed some areas of the plant but if you come in a little closer what i want to share with you is other areas that we skipped take a look at that damage in there and you can see the resulting sunburn to the entire cane of this particular rose again you can see the roses that are here but the growth on it is relatively wimpy compared to the growth you can see on this side which is closer to the wall and protected from the excessive heat that was exposed on this side of the plant um, what I want to share with you also, if you can come in a little closer, so you can see that the burn is over here. And I want to see if we can lift the cane and go underneath. And you can see that the burn went pretty much all the way through and around the entire plant. This entire cane just completely overheated. And as a result, the growth on this cane is stunted relative to, if you can see the growth on these other canes that are unaffected by the burn because they were protected by other canes, you can see that they're all still green and they're vigorously growing. Another example of burn within the rose, if you come in a little closer, is right in here. And this is definitely third degree burns. If I can peel a couple of these leaves back, you can see all of that damage. And there was none of this just a couple of months ago. As we pruned it, we cleaned it, you can see that this is all damaged. There's some cracking that's now happening. So this is evidence of now third degree burns being the bark is completely damaged the underlying cambium tissues are harmed and eventually that wood is just going to slough off and we're going to see the underlying wood but what's really going to happen is we're going to end up pruning that cane back and we're going to be a little bit more careful with our pruning practices make sure that we whitewash it especially when it's exposed to too much light let me share with you a couple of university studies that explain the importance of whitewashing your plants 
to prevent these issues from happening within your garden. Let's review those now. So this here is a PDF you can find on ivoryorganics.com um, under resources. And what I want to share with you here is just a couple of bullet points, even though pretty much all of these apply here. But this here is um, a quote taken from the University of California Agriculture and Natural Resources, where it says whitewash young trees routinely at planting. And over here it says whitewash older trees if they develop sparse canopies or are severely pruned. Again, um, University of California. And in this example, when we first planted the blueberry, we whitewashed the entire plant using this product over here. The protection against damaging sunburned insects and rodents, ready to use spray. But what I wanna share with you is that these cans can also be used to make the ready to use spray and each one of these pint sized cans can make as much as five gallons of the foliar spray and let me share that with you if you take a look here the yellow can is just like the yellow spray bottle the protection against damaging sunburn insects and rodents here's the ivory organics products registered material for use in organic agriculture and on the back by simply filling up the can you'll have your brush on directions secondly as a foliar spray, it says you can use one to two teaspoons um, of the prepared brush on solution per gallon of water. But in fact, this product can make, again, as I said, five gallons of the foliar spray. And thirdly, as a tree paste direction, it says add a quarter cup of water to the contents. So with a quarter cup of water, I'm gonna have something that's gonna have the consistency of like toothpaste, and it'll be about a third, of, a third or a fourth of a can. Similarly, take a look at the blue label. And the blue label also has your brush on directions, your foliar spray directions, and your tree paste directions that are identical. The blue label, the focus is protection against damaging summer sunburn and winter sun scald. And whereas this one has the added benefits of protection against insects and rodents because it has the added oils of castor, cinnamon, clove, garlic, peppermint, rosemary, and spearmint. And when you open the product, let me do that together with you. If you take a look here, the yellow label comes with your organic base powder as well as a bubble wrapped oil vial. And the oil vial contains those seven natural garden oils. Because I don't have an issue with any of the pests and my primary goal is to give it that insulation and protection from summer sunburn as well as in regards to insulation, give it the insulation from the extremes of winter. By whitewashing the plants, it's gonna keep the plants better protected from the extremes of the cold, as well as um, if there's any chance of extreme wind. I know that there's been a lot of um, customers that have um, experienced success in also protecting the plants from wind burn as well that way. So we're gonna basically put the contents of the three in one away, as today we're gonna to be working with the whitewash product. And let me share with you the lid as well. If we take a look at the lid here, it basically reads, protects newly installed plants and trees, shields pruning damaged surfaces. So with all the pruning we did, we're also gonna be coating those surfaces. Um, a lot of the research talks about using a chemical paint when whitewashing your plants, but paint is designed to last for decades and it has a half-life, meaning it breaks down over many decades. And so when applying it to your plants, that bark and that skin layer of the plant is basically changing itself out on average every one to three years. And all of that chemical paint product, if that's what you're using to create your whitewash solution, is gonna wind up in your soil and it's gonna remain in your soil for decades. This again being um, organic is a healthier alternative um, to whitewashing your plants and offering them the protection. So here we are now, we basically are taking the organic based powder we're adding it to the can. And now we're simply gonna add water. And then stir it well. And 
now we're simply going to take our brush and we can begin to protect the canes like so. So when and why whitewash? In regards to the when, the ideal time for whitewashing your plants is immediately at the time of planting. If you're repotting your plants or potting or taking your plants from the pots and planting them in ground, whenever you move the plant, by whitewashing the plant, you're minimizing the risk of transplant shock, and plus you're creating a cooler plant. When you purchased your plant from the nursery and for its entire creation of that plant, it was always in a group, but when you're taking it home and you're planting it and it's standing alone, it's exposed to the most amount of light and therefore exposed to the most risk of sunburn. And that is, again, before that happens, the ideal time for whitewashing is as soon as you do anything with the plant. So again, as soon as you plant it, if you're repotting it, or again, from pot to in ground, that's an ideal time for whitewashing a plant. And similarly, when we planted this blueberry within the container, we whitewashed the entire structure. We didn't coat any of the um, any of the canes, or as with a tree, we didn't coat the tree trunks, um, as it had too many leaves and it was too bushy of a structure. But what we did do is we just basically whitewashed the entire structure, something you would never do with a chemical paint. What we used was this Iver Organics 3-in-1 Plant Guard, ready to use spray for protection against damaging sunburn insects and rodents for use on your roses, fruit, nut trees, ornamental trees, and shrubs as a non-toxic, environmentally safe, and organic product. Being that we've significantly pruned the plant today, and now there's gonna be more light entering the understory of the plant, it's an ideal time to be whitewashing the plant. So what we're gonna do is take our whitewash formula, I've already added water to it. We're just gonna stir it, and then we're gonna take our brush here, and we're gonna start coating the canes of this blueberry so if you come in a little closer you can see how I'm basically coating the cane trunk and then you can see over here where I've pruned the branch that's all an exposed area of wood open now to beetles and termites to enter the wood until eventually hopefully it heals between now and more likely than not it'll be next spring or summer that that wound will heal itself but in the meantime we can now coat that had I done this with a chemical paint whether it be latex or a tar based product that would be trapping moisture within the um, damaged wood being under there and that can actually result in more damage to the plant than the good that we're trying to offer it by protecting it from the entry of beetles and termites this product being non latex and non tar is a porous product that will allow moisture to pass through which results in a healthier product for the plant. So I'm basically going to continue brushing on the product over all of the exposed canes and wherever there's leaves I'm just going to leave that alone and I'm not going to brush the solution on and rather I'm going to use the foliar spray. And that's pretty much as far as I can go with the brush on. When the leaves fall in the fall or in the autumn, I'll probably continue with the brush on being it's offering the most protection. But what I can also do right now to offer it some protection is I'm gonna take the ready to use spray as I've already got this ready. But keep in mind, I can also use this to also make my own ready to use spray as one pint size can can make up to five gallons of the foliar spray. But what I'm gonna do now is just simply spray the entire plant structure like so. And if you come in a little closer now, you'll notice that there's a nice light white film, an organic film that's gonna be protecting better the leaves and the stems from any extremes so that the plant fares well during the duration of the rest of summer and as it goes into winter as well. And here we are now in the middle of August and have at least another two to three more months of growth that we can expect here in Southern California off of this blueberry variety. What I'm gonna to wanna to make sure is that I've got all of the minerals within the soil 
to expect the maximum amount of growth and the maximum amount of health so that all of that can go towards maximum blossoms and ultimately supporting the maximum yield of fruit come spring. So to do that, what we're gonna be using now is the Ivory Organic Six Macros Fertilizer. If you take a look at it, the Six Macros Fertilizers have all of the macronutrients plants need. It actually says it right here, all the macronutrients plants need, plus, and I'll share with you, the product has N for nitrogen, 13%, which is significantly higher than most organic fertilizers, and phosphorus at 12%, potassium at 13%, magnesium at one, sulfur at three, and calcium at three. These are all of the macronutrients plants need, and most fertilizers are lacking in at least one, if not several. Most fertilizers only focus on NPK. The value of the six macros plus is it has all the macronutrients plants need, plus the plus is if we turn it over, it has a lot of the micronutrients being iron, manganese, zinc, copper, and boron, and then it has a lot of beneficial bacteria and mycorrhizal fungal spores. If you take a look at the derived from, it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, um, seven or eight lines long, and you can see all of the ingredients per line. Um, so a very exhaustive formula, whereas most organic fertilizers only focus on anywhere from two to four ingredients. Um, so again, a very complete, exhaustive formulation. And over here, and this one again is the super blend fertilizer being the ex with the exhaustive list of all of the beneficial bacteria and mycorrhizal fungal spores but if you take a look here this here is the premium blend with the extra calcium the npk is less with 244 and then mgsca with 1 2 and then 17 percent calcium if you take a look at the ingredients here they're a lot more simple being it's only two lines long but it also has one percent of the six macros plus super blend being that it's just such an exceptional fertilizer and that it's got the most and as much as possible of all the good stuff that plants would need. Um, so what I'm gonna be doing is I'm taking my four pound bag over here and what I'm gonna simply do is just take a few tablespoons and scatter it around the soil level. This is going to be the last feeding for this plant for the year. The best time for feeding your plants will be spring summer, and for us in Southern California, early fall. The goal is that with all of these nutrients, the plants are gonna capitalize on all, having all of the elements necessary for optimal growth. We're going to now simply rake that into the top one-fourth to one-eighth of the soil. We're being careful not to disturb any of the surface roots as we just saw in that diagram that all of the life of the plant, whether they be trees and ground or if they're plants in containers, a lot of that life of the plant is in just the top 18 inches. And those surface roots are very important and critical towards um, breathing, reaching the oxygens and reaching all the minerals near the surface. So all we simply need to do is scratch the surface with the product. What I'm going to also do, being that blueberries are acidic loving plants, is I'm gonna add something that also is gonna further acidify the soil. And one way to accomplish that is adding peat moss. Have peat moss within them. I'm simply gonna scatter some of that across the soil as well. And another good practice is to also add wood chips and there's at least 10 benefits of adding wood chips to your plants. The first ones that come to mind is it's gonna help retain moisture, so it's gonna cut down on the need for watering. In addition to, it's gonna keep the weeds down. In addition to, as the wood chips break down, it's gonna add further elements to the soil with each watering naturally. Um, and so, we're simply gonna add these wood chips to the soil. So this is now our third container of wood chips. Ideally, you want to have about two to three inches of wood chips, chips around the soil. You don't want to add so many wood chips they end up smothering those surface roots. At the same time, you also want to make sure you don't have the wood chips too close into contact with the canes of the plant. Or if you're doing this for your, your fruit trees or any other trees, you wouldn't want the wood chips to come in contact as the wood chips are going to absorb moisture. You don't want that moisture to come in contact with the tree trunk and thereby causing a phenomenon known as stem rot. So we're gonna pull all those wood chips away from this 
canes of the blueberries. Three ways of improving the acidity of the soil, and if you have any other ones, feel free to write those down in the comments, but one would be adding pine needles, and in this particular mulch, there's some needles within the mulch from pine. As the pine breaks down, that further adds acidity to the soil. As we already discussed, using peat moss also further increases the acidity of the soil. And a third one would be to add a sulfur-based fertilizer, and as we saw with the six macros plus, it has sulfur within it as well. So um, these are three ways that just come to mind in ways of increasing the acidity of the plant. And the last and final step, water. If you've enjoyed this educational moment brought to you by Ever Organics, be sure to give us a thumbs up and most importantly by subscribing down below you'll be connected to this and all of our other educational gardening videos. Most importantly for those of you that have already subscribed, don't forget to hit that push bell notification near the subscribe button so you don't miss out on new videos as they become released. Thank you all again for watching and happy gardening.